um, several people that come back. Now, uh, just so I get it on tape, Robert Goldsworthy and retired. Retired. Did you, did you do career in the? Uh, no, I was, um, I got 35 years, but as active and active reserve. And then I retired after my 35 years. Wow. But I was uh, really a civilian during the last years. I farmed down south of Spokane here a ways. Oh. So, in which branch of the service were you in? Air Force. Air Force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how did, did, now, did you grow up in Washington or somewhere else? Oh, yes. I, a little town south of Spokane, Rosalia. You probably never heard of it. No, I have. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, I'm a Wazoo grad, even though we can't oh, say Wazoo well. anymore, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what we all do, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to stop saying Wazoo. <laughs> well, I've still got to write my letter to the president because I think that's so stupid. <laughs> oh, I couldn't understand, but I, I don't think anybody could pay attention to it. But, but you've been through Rosalia then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my family homesteaded out there years and years ago and a uh, farm outside, so I grew up there and went back there after the I was in World War II then in Korea. When I got out after Korea, I, I got out and stayed in the active reserves and went back to the, help my dad. He was getting elderly. So were you on the farm when, when uh, Pearl Harbor happened? or where were you? No, I was in the service then. I went in I, about a year I was in the service. And uh, I was stationed down in Texas when Pearl Harbor. I was a flight instructor down there, and then Pearl Harbor and everything changed. The whole world changed. Do you remember hearing the news? Oh yes, very well. I uh, uh, we heard it on the radio, and I remember one of my friends down there that um, that I flew with. He was around the house and he says, oh, geez, you know, we'll, we'll win this war in about two weeks. He said, it'll all be over before we ever get a chance to get over there. <laughs> sure, sure, two weeks. And we underestimated that pretty well. But, uh, yeah, it was um, you know, like any other place, Pearl Harbor. Remember Pearl Harbor? It had us all excited and it was, uh, well, it changed the world. Of course, the world already and half of it was in flames. But this did it. Did, when you got in the service, did you have any idea that you would be, like a lot of kids joined today, well, up to a couple of years ago, joined and they thought, hey, this is a pretty good job. And then all of a sudden when they had to go to over to the Middle East, they went, oh, wait a minute, we didn't <laughs> sign up for this tour. Yeah. When, when you got in, did you have a pretty good idea that possibly? Oh, not when I went in. I, I wanted to fly. And I always, as a little kid, I had a love affair with airplanes. I don't know why, because nobody in my family ever interested in flying out there in the farm. But my brother went into the service ahead of me. But uh, but when I was small, Lindbergh, I think, by golly, I think it was Lindbergh's flight that really I was going to fly. And I was, as I remember the sixth grade when Lindbergh made his flight. But uh, he was kind of a hero for me from then on. Well, anyway, I went in... Um, uh, a year before the war started, so uh, I was commissioned and had my wings and uh, was a flight instructor and life was pretty. I, I really enjoyed it those days. Then then my wife came down to Texas and we got married and uh, all my other classmates were getting married. So, you know, it just, it was a great life. If I uh, thought of any period in my life that was, I would do over again, <laughs> it would be that year before the war started. Was that your sweetheart from back home? Yeah, yeah, we'd gone steady since high school days and through Washington State and all the time. So we, uh, she came down, we got married to Randolph Field, Texas. But then the war started, you know, and everything changed. Um, um, my classmates were going overseas and I wanted to get overseas and my wife couldn't understand it. And uh, we used to have some words about that. and. And I had a good job. I was a flight instructor in, in uh, advanced flying school in Texas, San Antonio, Texas. Then I got transferred to um, Smyrna, Tennessee, and they flew B-24s. And I thought then I would be going over to the 8th Air Force, but they kept me as an instructor again in B-24s. So I guess once I had that instructing experience, uh, they wanted to keep me on. So it wasn't until the B-29 came out, and I volunteered for that. And my wife kind of threw up her hand and says, ah, you're going to it, you're going to it. So that's it, go ahead. <laughs> and so uh, I went into B-29s and went overseas with the 29 wing. 
it's interesting because nobody's really talked about that aspect of it. Uh, they've talked about leaving girlfriends behind, but nobody's talked about actually having to have a discussion with their wife to... Yes, well... You know, people say things are hard today, but to be telling your wife that I want to go over, over mm -hmm. there... Uh, well, she certainly couldn't understand, and I can understand why she wouldn't understand. She couldn't understand my feelings, really. Well, after the war started, um, uh, I, I volunteered for B-17s uh, training at Sebring, Florida, and uh, told her that I had put my name on the list, and then we, we had quite a serious discussion. It was one way. I didn't say much, <laughs> so I went, took my name off of the list. She said, can't understand why you want to go over and, and get shot at. <laughs> and so, so I, uh, and then the B-24 list came out, and then I volunteered for that, and she said, all right. And that's when I went to Smyrna, Tennessee, then went down to Maxwell Field in Alabama, as an instructor, and but then when the 29s came out, and I said I just got to do it, <laughs> and so it's all right. But uh, it was if I'd known what was coming ahead, I don't think I would have been so eager to volunteer. But uh, I'd known I'd going to sit in that cell in Japan <laughs> that that winter. I uh, I think I'd stayed home. We uh, interviewed a gentleman from up in uh, Newport, and he's a ball turret gunner. Gil Langdon was his name. Is his name and and. Uh, he said, you know, we took all the training and everything like that. He says, I got on that first flight. He said, you know, in that training, I never, ever thought they'd be firing back at us. <laughs> yeah, and he said, I saw that. You know, the, the Always a little surprise when you see him uh, <laughs> shooting back. Our first mission, I was on Saipan in the Marianas for the old 73rd bomb wing, the first wing that um, uh, made the sorties into uh, Honshu Island itself, Tokyo area. And we went down to truck to the submarine pens and to bomb them. It was kind of a warm-up mission, really. Uh, and we didn't uh, really get it counted as a combat mission. But we made our runs on the submarine pens. And coming out, there was a Japanese fighter above us. And they used to have these phosphor bombs, uh, which were deadly if they ever got on you because you couldn't, they'd burn. They'd burn right through a wing. But he was kind of a ways off. And he dropped this phosphorus bomb, but it was real pretty, and it wasn't any danger to us. Then he made a roll and came on in, and you could see him shooting. And then we just kind of sat there. <laughs> so it took us a while before we shot back to say, he's shooting at us, just like your friend in Newport. You just couldn't believe that um, this was happening. But we just had a wide, eyes wide open. <laughs> and he was out of range. Uh, one of our formation went in and claimed that he shot him down, but one of our bombardiers said, yeah, I got him, I got him. Did you see that? <laughs> no one did. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good story. <laughs> How big of a, of a, and I mixed my terminology, but squ squadron would you be flying with? Uh, well, we had uh, groups then instead of wings, uh, and um, there were four groups to a wing, three squadrons to a group, and the 500th bomb group, which I belonged to, 881st Squadron, we had, uh, I think, nine planes to a squadron and uh, four squadrons. So um, a group then would be um, four times nine or ten, 40, 40 some planes. And what, what, to describe a, for somebody that's never been up in one of these planes, tell me about what your job is getting ready, getting on the plane, what the plane looks like, how much well, space. <coughs> now, B 29 was a um, uh, state-of-the-art airplane at the time, and um, it was pressurized, first pressurized plane that we had. And it was, um, it, it was a rush production. This thing was in, I think, on the drawing board in, in 42 when they first flew one, and it was 44 and we went overseas. And it wasn't quite ready. The engines were not very good. They had an overheating problem, and uh, they had central fire control, which means that the gunners would sit there with their sight at their blister, but the guns, the turrets are on top or on bottom of the plane. And so the gunners were electronically controlling the turrets and the guns through this site. And the only ones that really had guns with him would be the tail gunner. Well, the central fire control was a new um, concept also. And it took a little while, uh, a lot of times a gunner would be lined up on a target, but the guns wouldn't be quite harmonized and it would be just off a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, you don't shoot down many things like that. But it was growing pains. You know, they, they worked on that. And the engines, uh, we were in um, 
Kansas with our first training of the B-29s, and we didn't have many. We were flying more 17s than we were B-29s because we just didn't have the airplanes. And um, at the hot Kansas summer, and these engines would overheat so badly that a lot of times we'd taxi down at the end of the runway, uh, shut down all engines and wait till the cylinder head temperatures came down into a safe range, then start up and go before the um, needles got up into the red again. And you know, you always um, check mags on tail on before you take off uh, to see that all the magnetos are functioning and it's just routine. But uh, you sit there in the end of the runway and run up your engine and check your mags, but then we got checking them on the takeoff roll and you don't like to do that because you switch a little too far and you've lost an engine. And so, but that was uh, some of the uh, growing pains we had in this B-29 and um, it just was not quite ready uh, for a combat flying. It uh, too many problems. We lost a, <clears throat> a lot of planes uh, through engine failures. And in fact, I landed in Kansas one time. There's a 29 going in right ahead of me. And uh, I was on the final approach back. And as soon as the one ahead of me touched down, an engine fell off. The whole engine <laughs> it came off. And it was rolling and tumbling down the runway ahead of me. And so I was going to go around, but then it finally rolled off to the side. So uh, we went ahead and landed, but you just couldn't believe seeing that whole engine. It wasn't just a prop or anything. The whole engine came out the way. Well, those, those things happen, but um, uh, they finally made a tremendous airplane out of the B-29. And um, it was good, good instrument airplane, good solid platform for bombing and pressurized. And this is one of the things that got me into a lot of trouble. Um, we call it a shirt sleeve airplane because uh, it was temperature controlled in there, pressurized, you know. You could keep the airplane at high altitudes, you could keep it warm, and you didn't have to have heavy fur lined uh, flying clothes on. So, um, the day I got shot down, we leave um, Saipan, and it was very hot. So, I just had a summer flying suit on, as most of my crew. And then, of course, we got shot down, and a terrible hard winter was coming up in Japan. And I spent the winter in a little cold, freezing cell with a summer flying suit on and nothing else. And uh, no heat in the cell, no, no, just, uh, it was just terribly bitter, cold winter. Oh, I used to think of that winter flying <laughs> outfit that I had <laughs> that I never wore. But, but uh, yeah, I got so doggone cold that winter that I, I think it took me five years before I ever, after I got home and I ever got warm. How it, many missions had you flown before you got This was my third over Tokyo, so I didn't do much for the war effort. But what was the average? You know, I know some people flew a lot, but, but there were a lot that... Had... Well, we lost quite a few. We lost all our lead crews. I was a, a, a lead crew, and we lost... Um, all of our lead crews, we lost all our operations officers, which I was operations officer in the squadron, and had this crew. We lost uh, most of the squadron commanders, and uh, I don't know the percentage, but they, I think it was when it started, I think you flew uh, 30 missions before you uh, got to go home. Then I think they raised it to 35, but I was long gone by that time, and uh, so... Uh, a lot of them made it, all right. Some, um, uh, my co-pilot wasn't with me the day I got shot down. My uh, group commander had uh, decided to fly on my airplane, so he took my right seat and left my co-pilot at home. Well, he was assigned to another crew, and he went 30, 35 missions, and they never got a scratch. Just not a, they didn't even get a bullet hole, as I remember, and, and he got out, and, and he went home, but... Uh, of course, that's uh, luck of the draw. Other people got rammed. We had quite a few rammed by Japanese fighters. And that, uh, when they got those guns harmonized, we had a lot of firepower on that B-29. And so the um, Japanese were taking, were losing a lot of planes uh, just from um, aerial gunnery. We didn't lose many 29s from flak in those days. And uh, flak wasn't all that, um, uh, that accurate. They didn't have really uh, good radar-controlled guns, and um, so that wasn't so bad. We we lost some, but it wasn't too bad. But fighters were another thing. They had they had good good fighters at zero, 
And that Tony is what got me. And we, our intelligence said they can't fly above 30,000 feet. The planes won't get up there. But I was at 33,000 and they were sure flying around that day. <laughs> and so uh, we, we had to reevaluate our our information a little bit on Japanese fighters, but they were they were very good, and they were good at the start of the war, much better than anything we had. And if you remember the Battle of Midway, uh, when we had those uh, <clears throat> A-24s, and uh, we call them the Air Force, a uh, Douglas dive bomber, I think it was, and they were uh, out there dive bombing on those Japanese ships and just getting knocked down just as fast as um, a zero could come up on them because the zeros were faster and more maneuverable. And these fellas going into dive bomb, they were kind of trying to keep a steady platform for a proper uh, dive. And geez, they were, they were just getting out. What was that? Uh, Torpedo Squadron 8 where only one man out of the squadron that uh, ends in Gay. And his name was Gay, and he was the only one that floated around, got shot down, and uh, the whole squadron was demolished, eliminated, wiped out. And he floated around and watched that whole battle from his little life raft out there, and uh, the only only survivor. So they, um, in that Battle of Midway, then it really was a turning point in the war. And that was only six months into the war, but we were flying outmoded aircraft against the Japanese. Now when you, when you got to the South Pacific, did, did you fly the same plane all the time, or would you? Say? Yeah, we had our same plane. So, did yours have a name? I it, always see the ones with the pictures. Oh yes, I had a name. Uh, I named it Rosalia Rocket after my little hometown of Rosalia, as you could guess. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but we didn't have time to get it painted on the nose. So when we went down, why well, my nose was bare, no pretty girls on there or anything like that. But uh, that's what we had, uh, the Rosalia Rocket, and it didn't last very long. Cause we were up in Laconner a couple of weeks ago, and they had an article where the kids of the school had raised all this money to name, uh, get a plane named. And I guess when they rolled them off, I guess city might get a name, and it was the Lacan or something. And but that name only stayed on oh. until it got to wherever, and then <laughs> oh. it got erased. And somebody oh, else. oh yeah, yeah, that happens. So, your crew? Did you fly with the same crew all the time? Yes, I had the same crew, and. Um, I'm the only one left right now today of that crew other than uh, my co-pilot who didn't fly with me that day, but um, he's, he's still alive. All the rest of them are. Uh, <clears throat> I had 12 aboard since I had my group commander flying with me, and I had a full colonel out of wing headquarters that uh, flew along as an observer. And he went with me, I guess, because my group commander went along with me and they were friends. So anyway. Uh, so I had 12 aboard, and as far as I could tell, uh, piecing it together afterwards, nine got out of the airplane that I can account for. But I personally could only account for five in the Kempe Thai prison that I was in. And out of that five, uh, three of us came home. So three out of the 12 made it back to the States after the war. This uh, Colonel out of wing headquarters, he was in the cell right next to me. And, uh, he he, kind of lost his, his reason. He uh, he died about two months is all he lived. It was a pretty bad treatment. And yeah. where were you? Uh, the mission. What was the mission that day? You the mission was a Mitsubishi aircraft engine factory outside, about halfway between Tokyo and Yokohama. I don't know if, if you heard the three five seven. That was the number of the target. And it's an infamous number. We everybody only has mentioned three five seven. Oh, you don't talk to me about three five seven. We lost more airplanes over that one target than any air, any target in Japan. And it was an important target because it was an engine factory. And uh, and our bombing was pretty bad. See, so those, those first um, raids that we made, I don't know if we hit anything. We thought we did, but then we found out after the war that the planes were hitting 357, but the Japanese were um, just kind of patching up the roof and make it look like it was in production. So we'd have another mission, then they'd have all the air fire, all the fighters around in the area all lined up in order to get them. And really, in the factory wasn't producing that much, but uh, we didn't know that until after the war. But we lost, I think, 50-some airplanes over that one target. 
is it was right, right in Tokyo area, very heavily defended. And kind of a decoy, basically. Yeah, they used it, as I understand, uh, later on the war, after we really had spent so many bombs on it, that, um, that it wasn't in production of what we thought, and it was kind of a decoy because we could pull us in and get the fighters up. So it, um, that we lost a lot of planes on. So 357, that's a, <laughs> that could be nightmare time, <laughs> thinking of 357. So you took off, off of, let's see, you were flying off of? Saipan. Saipan. Yeah. Uh, took off in the morning? Afternoon? Oh, we took off about, uh, I think, take off around 8 o'clock in the morning. And this is about a 16-hour mission. And um, so um, we get up there in the afternoon, and uh, we go up in formation. In fact, I didn't get over the target my first mission. I was leading that one, too. But I had an engine failure, and uh, so we got up over the island. We salvaged our, salvaged our bombs, and I and pulled out and let the deputy leader come on in. And I think we were in the air 18 hours on that mission, coming back on three, we were slow and slower. But the missions ran around 16 hours, and that's a, that's a long flight up there and back, especially with uh, uh, over water. And uh, we had three submarines stationed out there, uh, rescue. And, uh, but you take um, uh, 15, 100, 1,800 miles open water from three submarines, <laughs> you know, it, they don't spread out very, <laughs> very far. So it, uh, but we did have crews picked up with those subs. And uh, in fact, when I got hit, the first fighter that came in got me a, I was losing gasoline and I knew I wasn't going to get home. So I had the radio operator call the submarine uh, rescue and say we would start giving our positions because we were going to have to ditch on the way back. But uh, then we, we got on fire, though, so that ended that. But I had one uh, good friend that got picked up by a sub. He ditched on the way home. But instead of one of the rescue subs, it was a sub out on the combat patrol. <laughs> and they took him right back up into Tokyo Harbor, <laughs> where for 30 days they sat on combat patrol. And he had just bombed Tokyo a few hours before. There he is back up there sitting in Tokyo Harbor in that submarine, and he says, no, <laughs> never again. <laughs> they weren't going to get him on any kind of a boat whatsoever, let alone a submarine, but it must have been kind of interesting. They had uh, they'd let him look through the periscope. They were, of course, um, submerged most all the time, but they would go up to view um, um, shipping and uh, uh, battleship maneuvers and aircrafts and all that sort of thing, uh, aircraft carriers that uh, he could see, you know, the skyline over there on the, from that sub. But, boy, that, wouldn't that be something to uh, sit in a submarine for all that time and uh, just miles from home enemy shores? And No, he didn't like it. <laughs> Name of Bricker. I don't know what ever happened to him. Um, uh, so when you got shot down. You said you, you caught on fire. Is that what happened? Yeah, we were, um, we had a couple engines shot out and um, so, and had a runaway prop. So we weren't, uh, knew we weren't going to go any place. But then the, uh, we had a fire and I don't know where it started about it, but we had a wing on fire. And then the fire started inside, you know, oxygen uh, system can burn. And uh, so it just, uh, we were, we were very, hot inside and the whole plane was in uh, I had no contact with the guys in the back I didn't my intercom was all shot out and had no communication whatsoever but everybody could see that the uh, thing was going down had no control at what but altitude are you at? we were 33,000 so You've lost communication with everybody, so you can't give the bailout order. No, I couldn't, uh, but I, in the front end, uh, my engineer is sitting right beside the nose hatch where the our escape hatch is, and that's where the nose wheel comes in. And he was opening the hatch and kicking that nose wheel out because the electrical system was all gone, and uh, I couldn't. And But he got the wheel down, and so we got the guys in front um, got out all right, except for my, I don't think my navigator, he was right back of the turret, the uh, main turret there, and that's where the fire had started. And I think he and the radio guy uh, never got out. I, I'm sure that the fire consumed them. But my bombardier was 
uh, sitting in the, if you, I don't know if you've ever been to B-29, uh, well, a pilot, co-pilot of Bombardier is right there, and I could put my foot on him, he was that close, you know, and, uh, and uh, I, in fact, I did, I kicked him back of the head, <laughs> get him to get on up and get out of there because I was losing control of the airplane, uh, everybody else had gone, and uh, I had forgotten to hook up my emergency oxygen cylinder, you know, carry a little thing on your leg. And so if you lose pressure, why well, you can hook your mask up real fast to this, and it gives you about three or four minutes, I remember, of, uh, of oxygen. And, um, and, I'd for, and I went out of the airplane, I remembered I'd forgotten to hook that thing up. And there was a 33,000 feet, in a summer flying suit, temperature about 70 below zero, and you can't breathe up there. So luckily I remembered that, so I, I fell free when I went out, and I, and I tumbled down to about, uh, oh, I, about 20,000 feet or so, or 15,000 before I opened my chute. But I, then I saw off in the distance a, a parachute going down, it was on fire, and I didn't know if that was my little bombardier or not, because uh, he was uh, uh, right there when we went through, and if he had popped his chute or if his chute had caught a fire some way, because I was burned, the uh, skin off my hands had been burned off and uh, face had burned, and so it was, he might have been, uh, his chute might have caught a fire, but I don't know, but I saw this chute and it just kind of disintegrated and, and disappeared, and whoever was in it obviously was killed, and I never heard again from my bombardier, so I don't know. I always thought that might have been uh, Pat that was in that chute, but I, I fell free, so I was uh, out of the flames. Do, do you, this is what history books don't tell us. Do you remember, well, ballpark, how old are you now, 20s? Uh, I was you know, 26. When, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. In a situation like this, does your mind take control and can you slow the world down or is it chaos and you think, oh my goodness, this is... <laughs> well, uh, pretty much chaos. <laughs> I, as I remember, I, uh, uh, I did think when I went out of the airplane, I remembered that oxygen tank and uh, that I didn't hook up, so I made my free fall. But after I got um, uh, my chute open and it was a beautiful day, it was the third day of December, of 44, and it was a bright sunshine day in all of Japan, all of Tokyo, down there for me. But, and I was, uh, it was, my mind was a whirl, but I made a, a kind of a real sincere prayer. And I said, God, I am falling into some deep, deep trouble. Please give me the strength to endure. And so I kept that in my mind. It, and, you know, everybody kind of talks to God a little bit. <laughs> so I, and I did. I said, but please give me the strength to endure. And I knew it was going to be a tough go. And, I, and they killed so many of our guys. And after the war was over, well, just recently, in the last few years, we've been getting reports on the number of B-29 crew members who were beheaded. And uh, it's surprising. They, they killed so many of these people. And we were one of the first crews that they got, and I had two full colonels aboard, so they surely wanted to keep us alive. But a very interesting story. Uh, uh, when I vacationed on Maui in the wintertime, I met a Japanese lady over there by chance, and uh, she was living in the same condominium that we were in. And she was a teenager during the war, and as it turned out that she lived pretty close to the Kempitai prison that I was in in Tokyo, and then uh, later in the war, uh, her home was burned down during the uh, fire raids, and she was moved out to Omori, near Omori, where the Omori PW camp was that I was in. So we were neighbors all that time. Well, this is 50 years later <laughs> that we found this out, you know, so we had a lot of fun. I accused her of being among the women that beat the tar out of me <laughs> when I landed. And she accused me of burning her house down. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, in fact, I got an email from her just yesterday and uh, in uh, Yokohama. But anyway, she um, kind of got interested in um, the history of, uh, of where my plane went down and this sort of thing. And uh, uh, so she arranged over a period of time, she investigated, she found out where my plane crashed, she found a guy that was in on my capture, she found a, uh, 
the village where they they took me uh, and they were the villagers were going to beat me to death and they were getting a good start on it and a village leader came out and says no we will not kill him and so they didn't and they they took me down to the Kempitai the Japanese uh, military secret police and uh, but I met that fellow he was 90 years old at the time, about four years ago when we were in Japan. And I met him, a little old guy, all souped up. But he's the one that saved my life. And he wrote me a poem. And I wish you could see it. Um, and it's in a frame. He gave it to me all framed. And something about an airplane it came over the skies. A pilot, Robert, was at the control. The plane was on fire. And it said, at the end of it, it said, at the first time, he was not welcome, but he was ardently welcome today. And I've got that hanging in my front room. It's a very treasured thing. But yeah, the fellow is 84, 94 now, and I think he's still alive. I used to write him at Christmas time and say, hey, thanks a lot, because <laughs> I'm here because of you. Did, did, did you have enough of a conversation with him to say why? No, I, of course, I couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't speak any English or Japanese, but, but I had my little friend Nori from Yokohama was with me all the time, and she speaks very good English. No, he, he said, no, we will not kill him. And uh, I think he knew that they would want me primarily, but, but his main idea was, no, we are not going to kill him, whether they want him or not, that uh, we do not uh, take somebody like that and kill him, beat him to death. But they did a lot of them, but uh, so this, this fellow... I have his picture at home, and uh, he, he saved my life. But uh, you know, but the women gave me a good beating. <laughs> so I, I told my little friend Nori from Yokohama that, that the women were the meanest people in the world. <laughs> but, Was this just walking through the streets that they beat you? No, with? they caught me cornered. I, uh, I, I didn't know where to go. I landed in my chute, and I was up in the Chiba Prefecture, which is up north part of uh, Tokyo, about 80 miles north of Tokyo itself. And um, I didn't know. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. And I thought, well, if I can just get down to the ocean, uh, Tokyo Bay, maybe I can steal a ship or a, a steal a boat and kind of get out. And uh, I don't know where I'd go. And then I thought, well, if I can get into the mountains, maybe I can get in the cave and hide out. But then wintertime, <laughs> who's going to feed me? So that went. <laughs> so I started. I got up, uh, uh, walked around a little road, and there's a Japanese lady ahead of me, and she was pretty frightened of me. She disappeared into a house, and uh, I walked around a road, kind of curved around to that, and 50-some years later, they took me to that road when I went back to Japan, and I took my wife, and we walked around that little road where I had been. But the uh, uh, civilians uh, got quite a crowd. You know, you come down to Japan in a parachute, a lot of people see you. <laughs> There's no hiding. So they had this crowd of civilians together, and then they had the um, um, squad or a group of soldiers. Um, and they were coming down the roadway, and the civilians had me cornered the other way. So I, I gave myself up to the um, soldiers, and they tied me all up with ropes, and then they turned me over to the civilians. And that's where I got my first <laughs> taste of welcome in Japan, because they... They gave me a good beating. That's when they were they were going to uh, kill me. That's when this elder, he was he wasn't elder then, but uh, they came out and stopped it. But I'll tell you, they wasn't uh, uh, the group of soldiers that came down. They had the lead uh, fellow was a gunso, a, um, a sergeant, and he had his samurai sword. And there were no weapons among these people at all. And I had my 45, and I had it out, and I, I just had that aimed right at him. And he didn't falter one step. I tell you, he must have looked into that barrel of that 45, and it looked awful big to him. But I'll give him credit. He never broke stride, and, of course, I couldn't pull the trigger either. So I put it back in my holster. They came down and took it. But um, I, I often wondered, uh, that sergeant... Uh, <laughs> What he must have been thinking, <laughs> looking at that barrel of a forty-five, it must have been looking as big as a cannon. But uh, he, he was a brave little kid, if that whatever. He, maybe not a kid, but but uh, then they they let the civilians 
have a go at it and but you got used to beatings so were they did they was it mom mentality where they were throwing stuff at you or did no they, they were mostly with clubs and a lot of them had um uh rakes uh garden impl hose handles i remember one little old lady she had a sharp stick and one thing that saved me everybody's around uh trying to hit me with something and this little lady uh in her pajamas you know how the japanese <laughs> the women tied at the with their little two-toed shoes that they wore, and, and she was jabbing. And she'd jab at my face, and I'd cover up my face, so she'd jab me some other place, and I'd cover up, and she'd jab at the face again. I, I wanted to kill her. I, I really did. I, I think if I could have had my forty-five back, I might have shot that woman. But, um, but most of them had um, sticks or uh, implements or... Uh, Fists, uh, some, one thing was, uh, saved me, I think, um, beside that little old uh, elderly Japanese man, was there so many of them around wanting to get a swipe at me. <laughs> you no, know, they were getting in each other's way. <laughs> so they, but anyway, after a while, the soldiers broke it up, and then and this fellow said, no, we're not going to kill him. <laughs> and, and so I, they marched me down the road for a while. I was all tied up and blindfolded, and, and uh, kids would... Um, throw stuff then clods and stones and, and i was i was really my adrenaline was so high that i didn't feel much what was the, when it's interesting again this is a new experience that nobody's described it did you see a hatred in their face or is it just a mob mentality or yeah just mob mentality i think more than anything uh no i can't say that i saw hatred as such, but I'm sure they did because I just bombed their country. And, but this was at the beginning of the bombings. They, they hadn't been burned out by that time. And uh, the, the fire raids weren't until that next March where we destroyed so much of Tokyo. And so, um, but they just, I was an enemy. And an enemy is to be destroyed. And of course, uh, where these people were, my bombs hadn't come anywhere near them. We'd bombed 357, if you'll excuse me, that <laughs> 357. But uh, that's like me saying Jane Fonda. I don't allow that name <laughs> in my house either. <laughs> I, I just threw that in because I just don't allow the name said at my house. <laughs> anyway, yeah, 357 <laughs> is about the same way. But it, um, it, so as a matter of fact, later on in the war, the next year, the next summer, before the war was over, uh, when Tokyo had been burned out and other cities had been burned out, I'd, you didn't see the hatred then in the women. We were working outside when I finally got out of solitary confinement and out to the prison camp. And we were around civilians uh, to some extent. And no, I didn't, um, I, I saw more a resignation at the few civilians we get around. We. Um, uh, you've heard of the honey bucket details, no doubt. Well, we were tearing down, bombed out buildings and, and making uh, gardens, growing vegetables, and daikon, carrots, and this sort of thing. So, uh, But uh, one of our jobs was to go back into the little village there and the honey bucket detail, empty the, um, the benjos, the latrines of the houses, and carry it back to the garden for fertilizer. And um, I had a good friend, uh, he lives in Menlo Park, California now, B-29 Navigator, and I'm still in contact with him. We were a team on the honey bucket detail, and we found uh, the, some of the women back there that uh, were showed us real kindness. Um, uh, one gave us um, um, a bucket of hot water, which we never, I went about eight months before I even got a chance to wash my hands, so I had my clothes off, so you know, we're filthy and bugs and lice and fleas just always constantly with you but she gave us a little bucket of hot water and a little piece of soap so old Hap and I stripped down right there and and tried to scrub each other a little bit another woman gave us a, a little few soybeans we had seven soybean a piece roasted and it doesn't sound much but when you're starving to death seven little soybean is a life and death situation so but and they would come, my Japanese is very good, but they had something like, um, Skoshi might have sense of worry. I mean, pretty soon the war will be over. And, uh, and 
they would, uh, and the men didn't loosen up that much. But the women were starting to, they were resigned, I think, just get this war over. And they were, they were living pretty poorly too, and they were hungry. Not like we were, but, uh, but it was not a, a good life in Japan at all. And so I think it, when that war was over, reading our, our troops went in right away and there was no hostility toward them. I think that... Which was the camp that you ended up at? Omori, O-M-O-R-I. It was a headquarters camp in the Tokyo area. And they had uh, about 600 people in the camp but the uh, B-29 people, we were never considered uh, prisoners of war. We were considered war criminals because we had bombed uh, the homeland. And um, you know, we were not allowed out into the camp. We were in a barracks with a fence around us inside the main fence. We were held separate and always under guard. We were never allowed into the camp with all the other people, which are Americans and British and some Dutch and... Uh, a lot of people from the Philippines and um, Wake Island and uh, others, but we were never allowed out into the camp at all. And day and night we had armed guards on us because we were war criminals. In fact, I'd been, I went out for execution twice when I was in the uh, Kempitai prison down in Tokyo. And they had interrogated me and bombing civilians and all this, you know, then they finally uh, came in and uh, I signed something all in Japanese, which was evidently uh, I confessed to bombing civilian. Well, I'm sure I did, but not deliberately. A uh, 357 <laughs> was my target, <laughs> but I'm sure civilians are going to get hurt. But um, so they gave me um, a death sentence, execution. The rest of my crew got life imprisonment. But I was the aircraft commander, so uh, I got. Uh, I was going to be executed, and uh, I went out twice, and both times why they took me back to my cell, and what it was all about, I don't know, but uh, I don't know, what maybe they were, I don't know if it was a bluff or trying to scare me, that didn't work, I was scared enough, but... Uh, when you say you went out twice, you went, where did they... Out of my cell, into the courtyard, back of this prison, and... Um, uh, that's where they held execution. We'd heard um, uh, people get executed out in there. And so uh, they had a firing squad, and I was blindfolded, and I stood around there for a while, but there was a lot of talking and uh, a lot of activity around, and pretty soon the, um, I was all tied up, and they took me back to my cell. And I sat there for two or three hours, and they came in, we went out again. And I was... Uh, the firing squad was there, and uh, our soldiers with their guns. They weren't really lined up, but they were a, a squad of some sort with their rifles. So, and another hour or so. And uh, well, in fact, I heard um, a phone ring someplace, and uh, I guess I'd like to have been able to understand Japanese, but I couldn't. But uh, they uh, they chatted a while, and pretty soon a car came in that courtyard, a uh, staff car of some sort. And then they took me back to cell again. And I sat there a couple hours. Then they came in and took my blindfold off. Then they came back in and took my ropes off. <laughs> and so that's all of it. I, I never heard any more. What I think was that um, they, didn't, they were waiting for authority to go ahead with the execution and didn't get it. So that's all I'm just guessing. Do, do you, having never faced anything like that, do you come to a resolve? With your life? Well, uh, sort of, yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, I got, I weighed about 85 pounds when I got out of that uh, Kempi Thai cell. And I was sick, and uh, berry berry, maybe dysentery, I had fleas and lice, and, and uh, starvation diet, and you just, you're a little lightheaded all the time. I just, uh, uh, really, when I went out to that what I thought was my execution, I really didn't care that much. I just uh, just wasn't sinking in. I just, I just let's do it. And um, for a long time, I never thought probably that we were going to get out of that place alive. I knew they'd want us in for interrogation for a while, and uh, but when they were finished with that, I was 
I was pretty sure that they were never going to survive it. Once I got out the prison camp the next spring, then I thought I had a, a, a good chance because the food was a little more, and so I put on a few pounds. I think when I got on the hospital ship, I was uh, about 90 pounds, 95 pounds, so I had put on a, a few pounds. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a starvation diet down in the solitary confinement days, and a little little dab of rice, a little rice ball about three times a day, and, and uh, it just, uh, I thought maybe I'd go down to so, so low and then I'd level off, but it just wasn't that way. I was just going down, down, down. When I finally got out of the cell, I was just too weak. I couldn't uh, stand. And when I got out to prison camp and then things picked up. And once we got out there, we were a little more optimistic unless we were, uh, did something. A lot of rules you could break and you never knew what the rules were. But <laughs> if you broke one, you got beaten up. And <laughs> the guards... <laughs> They have a uh, kendo club. Now, kendo is a, kind of a martial arts game. Maybe you've heard of it, like uh, judo. But uh, kendo, and they do it with these um, bamboo clubs about yay. And, and they are, they're pretty clever, those things. But those guards uh, uh, working all the time with those kendo clubs, uh, beating on you all the time. And so you, you, after a while, you you get a little fatalistic and say, well... You know, if you're going to kill me, let's do it. But out the prison camp, and then we're all together. I hadn't talked to any American up to that time, and even though they're on cells on either side of me at the Kempe Tai, but it was uh, uh, pure silence. You couldn't talk to anybody, and you had to, but you'd um, have to get out in the middle of that. The, the cell was a wooden uh, cell with just a hole in the corner and absolutely nothing else in it. And it was bitterly cold, and they had uh, four blankets at nighttime. You could uh, put these blankets over you, but they're small <laughs> Japanese blankets, you know. And I was six one, so <laughs> but so uh, very hard keeping them. My feet got frostbitten, and and um, it was a miserable life. But in the daytime, you fold the blankets, then you get out in the middle of that floor, and you sit tailor fashion, you know. Well, I can't do it. I can't sit like that. I, I just, I thought my back would break in 15 minutes and I just, uh, I thought I was going to die of that. But uh, did it uh, 14 hours a day and and the guards would up, you're supposed to just sit there looking straight ahead and of course the guard would up and down then you'd lean over a little bit and you'd, oh, you'd try to stretch and oh, it was a misery. But Oh, the guards, they got bored with us after a while, too, and didn't pay that much attention. But, but it was a you know, miserable life there. How long were you in that situation? I was four months in the in the Kempe Thai cell. Four months. Mm -hmm. what, and, and you said 14 hours a day you had to... Yeah, I'll sit there in the middle of that floor, and uh, after a while, you get, you get kind of paralyzed. You get locked in the position. So uh, it was... Um, it, when they got, uh, we weren't such a novelty anymore. Why they weren't watching us all that much, and you would move around and, uh, and you know. But what I, do you think? Uh, uh, fourteen days of silence, babe. I mean, fourteen months of uh, how long? How long again? Oh, four months in the four months uh, of silence. Fourteen hours a day, well, all day long. But well, it uh, of course, when you get so hungry, all you do is think of food. And I thought of every meal I'd ever had in my life. And, and I, what I used to try to do, well, I used to try to uh, recall childhood events. And all. Well, your mind goes back into that. What I would try to do is out of mind experience. Now, uh, this is hard to explain, and um, I never could quite do it, but I, I tried to, since you know where Rosalia is, and our farm was about eight miles out of Rosalia when I was a kid, I would try to drive from Rosalia to the farm. Now you can imagine driving. I go across the bridge and I go under the Milwaukee trestle, down. but to actually sit in the car and out of body and to be not just imagining going there, but actually be doing it. And that sounds kind of crazy, but uh, I would I would try to do this. Uh, and once you could get it for just a little while. 
you didn't feel the cold or the hunger. I was actually in a nice summer day driving and I smelled the fields and the wheat or the plowed ground. You know, uh, you couldn't keep it up very long, but once in a while you could get into that state and it was worthwhile. But I, I would try to do that. And anything kind of keep your mind occupied, you couldn't very well blank out and just sit in the days because your mind was always working. But as I said, mostly it was about uh, angel food cakes that my mom used to make and apple pies. And so used you to, could actually attain the out-of-body uh, journey? Of for a short time, not not the whole trip. I, I would just for a short time, you could suddenly feel this, but then you'd be back into reality. But I, that's what I would try to work at. Yeah, if I could get it for a little longer each time and another mile and uh, you know but it was just something that um, I occupied myself doing otherwise I might go crazy in that damn cell <laughs> what about now you had uh, uh, your bride back at home is that something you put out of mind or is that something we uh, you know she um, when I went overseas uh, she had a sister living in Seattle and her husband was in the Navy, so she went to Seattle and uh, moved in a sister. Well, I, it was, uh, I was shot down December 3rd, and she got the telegram on December 7th, as I recall. And there was no, really no hope that uh, any of us are alive. It said the airplane was on fire and the scene of a wing was coming off. And but I was held as missing in action, but then uh, uh, until the war is over before they declare you dead. Anyway, if there's no, they don't see you crash. So, but she thought I was lost, so she went to business school in Seattle. And uh, she got secretarial training, and then right at the end of the war, uh, she got a job in a bank there in Seattle, a pretty good job to one of the vice presidents. And, um, and it was just shortly after that, the war was over, and they liberated us. Or she got word that, that that I was back and alive, so she quit her job. And I don't think the the president of the bank was too happy. <laughs> oh, you just hired you. Well, what do you want me to do? My husband's coming home. So, but uh, she she didn't think we were alive at all. Have you ever talked about how she dealt with that over the time, or is that? Oh yeah, it. Uh, she just. Um, it was. Fortune's war, and uh, and she knew she was going to be alone, so that's why she went to business school and to get a trade. She had been a teacher before the war, or before we got married, but uh, she didn't want to go back to teaching, and so now she just dealt with it like uh, uh, thousands and thousands of other young widows did. And um, but then we got. Uh, when the war was over, then the Red Cross got lists and announced uh, who was in it. But uh, go back to your other question. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't think about family as much as you'd think. When we were out the prison camp, and most everybody in there uh, was married, or uh, quite a few, but we never talked about wives much because you you were too miserable, I think. Uh, you're too hungry, you're too cold, and uh, it was such a miserable life. And of course, any desire for the opposite sex was long gone. So you had no feeling whatsoever, and uh, it just kind of dried up. Uh, and so, no one talked around uh, girlfriends or wives or just. See, that's where, where Hollywood's misconstrued because that's what they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, that uh, is what it was all about. And, I, and, you know, it's interesting. I haven't talked to a POW that did talk about that. And yeah. I'll ask you a question. I'll see if yours is similar to theirs. What did you talk about between other prisoners? Mostly food. <laughs> that's what everyone has yeah, said. Uh, I'll bet. And did you have a specialty that you, Warren Schwizow, <laughs> it was pancakes, butter, and maple syrup, and today he has it every morning. Uh, you, well, you got it. You know, I don't know why. I never thought of meat and potatoes. It was something sweet, and I thought of pancakes so much. Stacked with butter dripping <laughs> off the side and hot syrup running out. Oh, yeah. I like and understand that. I, it was the sweet things that we uh, we thought about. And... Um, 
or in uh, eggs. I used to think about eggs a lot, but uh, but uh, the pancakes. Yes, I went. I, I thought of a lot of pancakes, <laughs> candy bars, and uh, sweet things. I heard of one was even telling me that they exchanged recipes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got at home. I, I probably uh, six eight hundred. Uh, we uh, one one fellow in our camp was a uh, Navy pilot, Marine pilot, and they had given him back a little Parker fifty one pan, <laughs> which is surprising. They generally didn't give anything back, but we would get. Um, rice paper or paper out of tea bags if you could get uh, get them and we would write and I've just got I've got recipes just like you've heard oh yeah I've got them at home now just a little tiny print all the things I'm going to eat and uh, a kid named Stuffy Smith he was an aircraft commander from Chicago he's dead now too uh, of course Smith you call him Snuffy <laughs> but, but uh, we sat for Hours and hours planning our first meal when we got back to uh, to the states together, and his wife would meet him, and Jean, my wife, would meet me, and we just worked over this meal. Oh man, we got it all out, and I've got that written down at home too. <laughs> but he came back in the ship, and I came back in an airplane, so we never never got our meal. <laughs> and we worked on that, I tell you, and it, uh, it's very. Important, the least little detail <laughs> got to be worked out, you know. <laughs> and it was when you got something to, if they came in with a maybe a little fish, uh, about like a sardine, and so you can uh, you can fight over uh, dividing that fish up. If you got two of you know, so we had the rule. You probably heard it before. One will divide, and the other one will choose. And so the guy dividing that little fish spends a lot of time, and the one choosing, <laughs> you know, you measure out microseconds on that thing. Uh, but then they would come in and say, well, this little fish, there's going to be three of you or five of you on that. And then it's tough. And then uh, you can't one cut and one choose. So you fight over it. <laughs> Who's got the biggest piece? But, uh, yeah, it, uh, it was... It's kind of funny, but life and death at the time. Now you've talked to these other people, and so, and I, I suppose we all say the same thing on it. That uh, it just um, food when you when you starve to death, it it drives everything else out of your mind. Do you hurt when you're starving? I mean, what? No, not. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, hurt. You just. Uh, I don't know. It just, uh, you just, mind is on it day and night. It just all you think about is, is something to eat. What about oh. energy? I assume that you just. Oh yeah, we no energy at all. Uh, when we were out working, uh, going back to camp, uh, there would be a uh, leaving the street there. That we were right off the number one street from Tokyo to Yokohama. It's still there, only there's a freeway above it now. But there was a little hill onto a footbridge that went across a canal into our camp. And we used to sit, do you think you're going to make that hill now? <laughs> do you think you, know, you push me up today, tomorrow I'll push you up? <laughs> you know, it was just a little slope like that. But it, it, it seemed like Mount Everest to us sometimes. What did they have you, what was the, the camp, the second camp they made you work, is that right? Yes. We were. What was the purpose of that camp? I mean, what did they have you do? Oh, uh, gardens. Yeah, uh, we were, uh, and they told us, you know, if you uh, grow things well, why you'll get some of the vegetables. But of course, we never did. What they would do when the things got going, they uh, they harvest carrots, for example. And then they'd boil the carrot tops, and then they'd strain off the water and and give it to us, so it'd be green. But there'd be a little something in it, I suppose. But it's just boiled carrot tops. We never got any of the actual vegetables. Once in a while, they would put soybeans in our rice, which was the, about all we got three times a day. It was a bucket of rice divided up. We had 36 of us together in this one barracks. So um, they'd bring in the rice, and um, we had a rice dipper and a hot water or a soup dipper, and we'd get our bowls out. And we had one kid named Shorty Armstrong that would 
put the rice and see it. And we or everybody watch him, you know, if there's one more grain of rice in that bowl and in my bowl, there's trouble. And so, and so food was <laughs> it, it, very, very serious. And uh, I do have all those recipes that I kept all these years. And I, I look at them now and I, I can't believe that <laughs> it was so important at the time, but that it was. That's survival. I mean, that's yeah, that's survival. Yeah. Did 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 the guys joke around or at all? I mean. Oh yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, this uh, Snuffy Smith and I used to. Uh, we joke around some. Some people know. Some people would uh, curl up, and kind of in you know, a little ball and, and withdraw. And uh, we did have a, a deck of cards in there that the regular prisoners uh, outside our barracks. And uh, they, so they had a poker game going, but these cards got so worn, you know, anybody that could really play cards could know exactly what he had in every hand. But, and uh, one of the uh, prisoners uh, threw over the wall uh, a New Testament. And so we passed that around. In fact, I. I figured out I made a deal with God <laughs> that if I would read this New Testament from cover to cover, then he'd stop the war. And so I read it. Now, of course, it, it, it's so foggy, you know, very difficult to concentrate on anything, but I stayed with that and the war didn't stop. So I made another deal. <laughs> and I said, I'll do this again. <laughs> and, and then you'll stop the war. So I went through it. I didn't get through it. Other people wanted to have this thing too. <laughs> but you know, on Sunday, we tried to have a little church service in there, but we had to be very careful. In fact, um, I had arranged um, a quartet and four of us that were going to sing, um, when they call the roll up yonder, I'll be there. And we thought we were pretty good, but the, the we Sunday came, we all got up to sing this, and the guard just went berserk. He was on us day and night, of course, and he came in and he whopped us around with his rifle butts, you know, and he'd knock us down. And so we didn't sing anymore. <laughs> I didn't know whether it was our singing <laughs> or he didn't like the tune <laughs> or wanted a different song. I don't know, but we never tried it again. But he, the guard just went crazy. And we, you know, we thought it was, we just stood there at the end of the barracks, you know, and Everybody, these barracks were, um, they had a dirt floor with a little raised platform on each side about that high. And that's where we, and we had about um, that much space for each of us where our blankets would be folded up in the daytime. And we had, we had uh, these uh, rice mats, but they, we got rid of them. They had so many fleas and lice and everything in them that they, we just wouldn't keep those rice mats around. And uh, so um, the dirt floor there, but we went down at the end of the barracks and uh, geez, I thought we were pretty good on this song, but uh, some way it didn't go over. <laughs> yeah, we got knocked around. So would they, because you talked about also having, trying to have a little Sunday services. Did they do the same thing on the Sunday services? No, they, uh, what we would do is take turns just reading something out of this little New Testament we had just, Everybody could pick out uh, the little passage that they wanted. And what most people picked out was the one that said, don't care what you eat or drink. You know, the birds in the field, they don't care what, that we're going to be taken care of. So everybody wanted to read that. <laughs> don't care what you eat or drink or however it goes. <laughs> and, uh, but, so we find, so geez, everybody can't <laughs> read the same one, you know. Uh, so the birds in the fields, they don't, they don't care. But, um, but we'd pick out a little passage and, um, and take turns just, just reading that, but we never, never had anything much other than that. Let me, I gotta switch tapes here. Okay. Uh -huh.